Welcome everybody, really nice to be here. Uh, my name's Mike. Uh, well, there's only a handful of us, so I might as well hear everyone's names. Yeah. Damien. Damien. Matt. Matt. Peter. Peter. Aaron. Mel. Mel, awesome. And Soph hiding out the back. Hi, Soph. <laughs> well, I thought, uh, I figured with transitions and things, there might be a few latecomers. So I figured rather than trying to do a big intro, I'll just give you what I think is the best intro to, to the franchise. So I'm gonna be speaking on the whole Fast and the Furious universe. Uh, I'll probably interchange with things like Fast Family, Fast Diverse, just roll with it. Um, and so this is a clip from The Fast and the Furious, the first film, 2001. The original, and it, and it pretty neatly gives you a sense of what this, what this franchise is about. Now, the first two minutes is a bit of a waste of time. So, let's go, let's go back here. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that we know is it's not like a standby cup, it's like a racing cup. Let's learn that. Oh shit. That scene just gets more and more ridiculous the, the more that time goes on. And I mean, I'll talk about this a bit more later on, but one of the great things about the Fast and the Furious universe is how it started deadly serious and then turned into this post-ironic millennial trope fest. Um, but yeah, when, when we first see Vin Diesel and Friends, deadly serious, this is everything. I, I shudder to think how long it was to take Vin Diesel to learn that line about fuel injections. Like it would have <laughs> taken a really long time. Um, is it okay, okay if I pray to start, Aaron? Yep. Yeah, it's good. Okay. All right, let me, let me pray and then, then we'll get into the meat of it. Uh, God, I just want to thank you that you give us such creativity and you, you've given us the capacity to build these in, incredible machines and to think in creative and different ways. Uh, and I just pray that every time we can engage one of these machines and every time we can uh, use our own creativity that we're doing it for your glory and that we're doing it in a way that actually builds the world into a better place that points towards a better future. So we lift uh, up this afternoon to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, The Fast and the Furious. Has everybody seen a Fast and the Furious film? Has anybody here not seen any Fast and the Furious films? 
can't say I claim to see them all. <laughs> yeah. I've seen a few bits and pieces. You've never seen a full film? Okay. You've seen them all? <laughs> so. I have box set at home. My man. I, so this is my guilty pleasure. My wife and I, you know, like I'm a middle-class private school kid, you know, pastor, ordained in the Uniting Church or whatever. And I love the Fast and the Furious. Oh, no, no, no. And the other thing you should know about me is I love like hoity-toity movies. Like I love the Academy Awards season is my favourite season. Yet somehow I also love the Fast and the Furious movies and I can't deal with it. I can't get enough of it. Um, so just... A couple of things about me, you know, Aaron's already introduced me, but I, I will probably look at everything with the lens of evangelism. That's just who I am. I'm passionate about sharing the gospel. And, uh, and so when I, I look at a movie series or anything culture related, I'm thinking, where is Jesus in this? And where is it pointing to walk back towards him? Uh, you think of the parables and the miracles, how these are amazing things, but they're actually pointing back to something bigger. Fast and the Furious is like that. Yes, I did directly compare the Fast and the Furious to Jesus' parables, and I'm okay with it. A few house rules. If you need to go to the toilet, just go. If you need to ask a question, well, there's only a few of us, so you can probably just pop your hand up and we'll ask as we go. We don't talk about Tokyo Drift. <laughs> We're not talking about that. We're not talking about that. Not, not, not while I'm running it. And you can drink any beer you like, as long as it's Corona. That's, that's the rule in this room. Okay. I don't know if that's actually true. It's probably a dry premises, but still. Any beer you like, as long as it's Corona. So in a few sentences, the Fast and the Furious franchise, how would you describe it in a few sentences? The universe, oh gosh. Um, to, to me, the universe is underneath, um, you know, the glamour, the fast cars, the hot chicks. Um, it's, it's very much about loyalty. Okay. Loyalty. Good description. Good description. Well, I mean, we'll keep going deep later. But, you know, it's, it's basically centred around one character, which is strange because they keep ask, adding more and more characters and building the cast out. But it's all centred around one character, Dom Toretto. And we'll get into the Gospel of Dom a little bit later. But um, starting out with The Fast and the Furious in 2001, just in case you were wondering, it is a rip-off of Point Break. Like, it is a shameless rip-off of the movie Point Break. And they're open about it. They're not even ashamed about that. They so, say, yeah, 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 we, we stole Point Break and we put it on cars instead of surfboards. That's how we started doing the Fast and the Furious franchise. So it starts out, as you saw in that first clip, they are deadly serious. Like, it, it's quite funny how serious they are in that first film. Uh, and, you know, everything from a white guy like Paul Walker going, yo, check this out. I'm like, okay, let's settle, settle down, Paul Walker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, all of that. It's hilarious. And they've gone from this, it's about illegal street racing and low-level criminals to suddenly, 2017, we're talking high-level international espionage. Um, there are going to be spoilers all throughout this, so I'm, I'm afraid that's just how it is. But the fun is in watching it, not in knowing what happens, really. The twists are never that amazing. It's all in watching it. And basically, I've heard it described as James Bond for the millennial generation. And it is quite like that. It's all about gadgets and, and fast cars and fast women, sort of. It's a bit more egalitarian than Bond. Um, but, it, but it just goes high pace and you're not meant to believe it so much as enjoy it. That's the fast franchise. So essentially, there's the three central characters right there in the middle, Paul Walker, Vin Diesel and The Rock. Vin Diesel by far, far and away is the center of the fast universe. Um, and we've touched on it already, but it's sort of gone from being this straight-laced, this is an action movie and we are putting our craft into this for the teenage audience into let's do the most ridiculous, dumbest thing we can do and make it exciting. So uh, like, like you all, I, I hope we can live this session a quarter mile at a time. It's <laughs> going to be good. So in terms of the cultural impact that the Fast and the Furious franchise has had, so there's eight films. And there's three more already slated. So there's Fast and Furious 9 and 10 uh, predicted to be the end of the franchise. Sure, we'll see. It's spin-off central, I think. And, there's, and a spin-off has already been mooted with The Rock and Jason Statham's character, <laughs> Hobbs and Shaw. And again, that's kind of interesting in itself, and we'll get, we'll get into that. We'll get into that, too. So what did, this, what did this franchise do? It turned Paul Walker and Vin Diesel into superstars. They've really done nothing outside of this franchise. I mean, I know they've been in other films, but... Tooth Fairy movie. No, think... Oh, yeah, he was in that, wasn't he? What was the rock in that was almost identical? Oh, they had that one where he's 
Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's, no, yeah, was no, Vin, Vin was in the past five, Rock was in two, Sperry. <laughs> uh, career choices. So it turned them into stars. Turned Tyrese Gibson and Ludacris into actors. So this is Ludacris, the rapper Ludacris. He's actually really good. It's amazing. He, um, he, I don't know if you've seen it, but he was in the, um, uh, the movie adaptation of Max Payne. He played uh, Detective Brevere. He did a really good job. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Ludicrous. If you think about the Max Payne universe, yeah. it, he did well. Yeah. In, in Too Fast, Too Furious, he's got this massive afro. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's great. But when he shaves it off, he get, it gets a bit more serious. Yeah. There's a couple of classic memes going around saying, don't drive cars too fast or you'll go bald. Because <laughs> every, every main character, and then you had Jason Statham as well, all the men are bald. Yeah. They killed off the one guy with hair. Uh, what else did it do? Well, it kept uh, Michelle Rodriguez and Jordana Brewster employed. Again, they're not getting too many gigs in other places. It kept car movies cool. They were really going out of fashion, but at the same time, the original Fast and the Furious comes in with Gone in 60 Seconds with Nick Cage and Angelina Jolie. Um, but most importantly, we're in this era of reboots and nostalgia. And people have taken 80s culture and old school culture and rebooted it and tried to make it new again. The Fast and the Furious was the first franchise to take a serious old, old movie from 2001 and reboot it, really, eight years later, as a millennial film, as a millennial franchise to go, this is meant to be ridiculous. So it just beat The Expendables by about a year. And The Expendables took it to another level, which Fast and the Furious then kind of said, oh, you're going to do that? Great. That's what we've been wanting to do anyway. And we then went ahead and did the same thing. And so, so it's very... It's very interesting that way. They're now trying to have fun and appeal to everybody instead of being about teenagers. So originally they were really aimed at teenagers. Now, if you talk to the executive producers, they say we hit every demographic. And they don't mean that in a boasting way. They mean, if you look at the stats, older men, younger men, older women, younger women, they all come and watch the movie. It actually transcends demographic, which is, I mean, this isn't the film you would have thought that would transcend demographic. It's total take. Anybody want to take a guess at its global total take throughout the franchise? We've been pushing 7 billion. It's not quite that high. It's not, that it's not quite that high yet. Five. Five billion. Okay. Five billion dollars just in box office take. That's pretty respectable. That's pretty respectable. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, on, the, on all the lists of most expensive franchises, most money made, comes in about number seven, although some of the ones above it, like, Expanded Marvel Universe. Give me a break. That's cheap. That's like eight franchises in one. So it's doing well. I'm, I'm defending it like it's one of my own children. I do have three children. I don't defend them as hard as I do <laughs> Fast and the Furious. So for, for the purpose of the next sort of 20, 25 minutes, what I want to do is explore a few different aspects of the Fast franchise that speak to the way that it has transcended uh, gender and demographic and and the Christian themes that are saturated throughout it. And I really believe there are a lot of Christian themes throughout it. And loyalty is a good word. And uh, that's sort of underneath it all. So the first thing we'll have a look at, here's a quick overview of the key characters. Um, <laughs> I, should, I should have not put the names up first. No, no, not that fancy. So you've got Vin, obviously, Dom Toretto, Brian O'Connor, Letty, Hobbs, down there is uh, Mia, Deckard Shaw, Roman, he's great. Um, Tej, Han. Han, one of my favorite things. Have a look at his surname over there on the left. Han Solo. Amazing. Giselle, Mr. Nobody. <laughs> There's now a junior Mr. Nobody, but I didn't have enough room. And uh, Elena, so there you go. There's the main characters of the Fast franchise. And you could add another row easily. All right, so let's, let's have a look at family and Dom the father. So the clearest and most important theme in the Fast Verse is family. Like they, every single film, Vin rumbles something out. He's like, this is about family. Yeah. Tell me about your family. Everything's about family. It's mentioned constantly. And there's this hilarious scene in the first Fast and the Furious movie with Dom and Brian, where they're sitting, they're out in a balcony and uh, Brian just goes, tell me about your father. Like, people don't do that. Like, just, just give me some information. And Vin like, unloads and tells him everything about his dad. He's like, dad died in this high-speed car chase. And it clearly has shaped his life. But he also then talks about him like, 
Every week, Dad would run a barbecue for everybody. If you didn't go to church, uh, what's the rule? If you don't go to church, you don't eat first or something like that. Something like that. Anyway, it, it, he made his father out to be like St. Toretto of Los Angeles. It's unbelievable. Um, but they do this because even way back in 2001, they recognise the importance of family being essential to the films. So Dom starts out with this first crew, and you see that in the first movie. It's, it's just all these skinny kids around him that he's known since he was in high school and in primary school. Like, and he challenges one of them because Paul Walker's working his way into the gang. And one of them, Vince, is like, you don't even know him. And Dom says, I didn't know you once, Vince. And Vince goes, that was in the third grade. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is the sort of family they have. They've known each other, they've grown up together. So the level of trust, the level of loyalty is so high. And so they're all mates from school, but then the crew he begins to build around him are generally people who he's gone through huge moments with. And then on the other side, that loyalty has been built up. Dom Toretto appreciates loyalty and he chooses to invite people into his family. And what you've got to understand is whatever rhetoric they say, it is Dom's family. It is not a family, it is Dom's family. It is Dom the father. The franchise can survive and has survived without Brian, without Hobbs, without any of the other characters. It can't survive without Dom. So here's the first clear theological connection. In the faster verse, there are two families. There's Dom's family and there's everybody else. And everybody can come into Dom's family. It is possible, it can be done. We've seen a ridiculous amount of stuff happen where people can be brought into the family of Dom. But it's either his family or it's everywhere else. And you see clear parallels, you know, between some John 14, 6 stuff right there. I'm the way, the truth, and the nos, I guess. Um, <laughs> Dom, Dom is ruthlessly loyal. Ruthlessly. Which is why the plot of Fast 8 was so tantalising. How, how many people have seen The Fate of the Furious, Fast 8? Yeah, a few of you. Okay, so spoilers for those that haven't, but... Dom goes against the family. This is the big selling point. So the producers were considering stopping the franchise after seven uh, when Paul Walker died. There's a lot of reasons why that would have made sense. And the reason they didn't is because they came up with this one idea. What if Dom went against the family? What if the main character went against the whole theme of all the films? And it made it quite tantalizing. Why would he betray his family? For more family. <laughs> this is the, <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little bit inception-y. Um, he, he just keeps digging deeper into this sense of family. He's got to weigh up these two parts of his family and go, who needs me more, and dive that way. So it is possible to join Dom's family, though it's a hard path to walk. But everyone who encounters Dom has that chance to lean in and join the family. So here's a, here's a, a, a bit of linking to adoption and grafting in, just to bring the biblical language back in. Dom, like, like the Christian God, is creating a family that anyone can belong to. So you've got people like Mia and baby Brian, they're born into God's family, or close enough, like Vince and Letty, who were basically born in. But many others can be adopted in. You look at all the rest of them. You look at Tej and Roman, and of course, Brian's the, the main guy there in terms of being adopted into Dom's family. And then he ends up marrying into Dom's family, marries Mia. And just like the vision of the future church that we see in Revelation 7, this family is from every tribe and tongue, every colour, both genders. And it helps, I think, that Vin Diesel's ethnic background is quite unclear. Like he, he, Vin actually doesn't know his full ethnic yeah, background. Um, so Dom becomes easy to relate to. He's sort of this, you know, light brownish colour. He's in Los Angeles, one of the most multicultural cities in the world. It's very easy to relate to. Where do they go? In location, all around the world. They're in South America, they're in Africa, they're in Europe, they're back in North America. All over the world. With, in hey, the in the Middle East, yeah, yeah. I did, I didn't put that in, but yeah, driving between the Verge to Buy is amazing. Dom becomes easy to relate to, regardless of your ethnicity. All can be gathered into Dom's family, and this hits another significant point: that friends of the family you choose. Anyone heard that mantra a bit lately? I hear that quite a lot. Friends of the family you choose. Now, the whole reason I'm talking about Fast and the Furious is, is not just because I enjoy it, but because it's culturally significant. Anything, every time they make a film, they get a billion dollars. That's culturally significant. And, uh, you know, globally, even though Gen X and Gen Y are here, I think we push family pretty hard. 
we push that as, as quite a strong concept. We're still seeing rates of divorce and fatherlessness. You know, divorce is roughly, you have one divorce for every two and a half marriages on annual, on annual statistics in Australia. Uh, there's plenty of fatherlessness across the globe. And the franchise continues to have this idea of Dom as a working class guy who makes good. It's very, very easy to invest in him. And then it comes full circle and at the end of ep at episode eight, he's got his own child. And so the family motif and Dom as father becomes really strong. Now this is interesting because Dom's not only a father figure, he's a Christ figure. Now I'll, I'll try and go quickly through this because really every film franchise has a Christ figure. It's, it's pretty central to the sort of hero's journey idea. But Dom is a messianic figure. Um, you, you, every single time something goes wrong, they're not necessarily looking to each other so much as they're saying, looking to Dom. Even Hobbes, like The Rock is the hugest individual to ever walk the earth. And even he is going, I need you, Toretto. I need you. Like, you probably don't, you're gigantic. But he looks to Dom. Everyone looks to Dom when the going gets tough. Why? Because Dom has made it clear that he will sacrifice himself for his family. Sounds familiar. Christos Dominicus. <laughs> Oh, and I've, I should have adjusted the picture. He's wearing a cross. He's wearing a crucifix there. So here's, here's a quote that I shamelessly stole off a Catholic guy who, who did some good thinking about this. He wrote, When he's first introduced, Dom is, is an enigmatic outlaw with a heart of gold. By midway through the series, though, he clearly emerges as both the leader and, this should have inverted commas around it, moral centre of the Fast and the Furious universe. Like Jesus, Dom assembles a loyal group of followers, mainly blue-collar workers, Fishermen in the Bible, car mechanics, and Fast and the Furious, and the occasional government official, Matthew the tax collector, Hobbs the DSS agent. Not bad. To them, he imparts Christ-like lessons, like money will come and go. The most important thing in life will always be the people in this room. And you don't turn your back on family, even when they do. Compare that to Matthew 18, 21 to 22. Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Don's messianic nature takes another step in the fate of the furious where Elena, the woman that he turned his back on when Letty, his true love, came back, gives her life in protection of Dom's child. Suddenly, not only is Dom a messianic figure, but people are being martyred in the name of Dom. It's a very, very strong link. And where that goes to fairly naturally from father figure, God the father figure, from Christ figure, is to forgiveness. And this is, this is a picture from Fast 8 of Hobbs and Shaw. This is why it's so interesting. It's, I, I watched it again yesterday. It's, it, it hasn't been rough preparing to do this. It's, it's been a lot of fun. I don't want to think about just brute strength and speed and quickness. Oh, yeah, the park. Anyway, yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's an amazing scene. But one of the reasons that the franchise has lasted this long is because of its theme of forgiveness and redemption that echoes through it. There's so much. Not that I think audiences flock to forgiveness stories, but I think the Fast and the Furious franchise have learned how to monetize forgiveness as a concept. That's interesting. So the Fastiverse, they've got this family motif uh, and they've used forgiveness as a way to extend the franchise. So you look at the first film, it becomes Dom versus Brian. Then by episode four, the fourth film, Brian becomes Dom's brother-in-law. Forgiveness has extended the franchise. By the fourth film, Giselle, who we saw earlier, works for the villain, then joins the team. The fifth film, Hobbs is kind of the bad guy. The Rock is kind of the bad guy. Against Dom, then Hobbs joins the team. The sixth film, a guy called Owen Shaw is the bad guy. The seventh film, Jason Statham, Deckard Shaw is the bad guy. In the eighth film, they both work for Dom and Deckard Shaw, Jason Statham, is trusted to go and get his baby. Nobody else. He goes, yeah, you get him. I trust you. Deckard, in the movie earlier, kills one of Dom's best mates. He just kills him. A movie later, he's like, you know what? I need you to get my baby. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's forgiveness and maybe madness. Not a great scene. <laughs> not a great scene. <laughs> yeah, that is a great scene. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. They're not just doing forgiveness for forgiveness sake. The producers know what they're doing. They are monetizing it. They're extending a franchise. But the theme is so powerful and it leans back into family. Deckard killed Han, and Han was the coolest. He was like my favorite character, and one of Dom's disciples. 
Yeah, here he is buddy buddying with Dom and the gang. So I just want to show you a quick clip of that so you get an idea of just how ridiculous this is. This whole scene is totally idiotic, um, but it's very fun. And hey Google, what are some good TV dramas? TV programs frequently. You don't, need, you don't need to tell us Google, it's fine, thanks. And again, the first two minutes. Uh, all right, so just the next two minutes here. Nobody keep in touch. Uh, hang on a second. This could be interesting. What do you think I'll do it? Well, I saw that look you gave Slytherin. I knew you wanted revenge. Glad I did it. Can't believe you want to see my mama. <sighs> That's it. That's all it took. That's all it took. Statham comes back in. The Rock, who he's been fighting with for three films, The Rock is an, basically an FBI agent who's been chasing him for years, just looks over as if to say, oh good, he's here. Welcome to the barbecue. <laughs> and they're set. This, this is the latent forgiveness that we see. And here, here's the thing. Yes, they're monetizing forgiveness, but you can only monetize it if people want it, if people are hungry for it. And there's a hunger that's underneath that. Humanity is hungry for redemption, desperate to see more forgiveness. And I think that Deckard Shaw scene is the best and it goes on to, to a scene around the table. Um, and we'll get to that, I'm just conscious of the time and wanting to power through. But there's, there's so much good stuff in the Fasterverse. Let's just look at the table. Grace and the table of Dom. So at the end of every film, they gather around the table and it's incredibly powerful. And I think there are two different ways that you could look at it. The first, first is it could point to a pluralist worldview that I would call hashtag thoughts and prayers. Now, I don't know if you watch Bojack Horseman. There's a, I think it's brilliant. And there's a, there's a very, very funny scene where the blonde girl on the right is putting out a movie and uh, it's about uh, being an assassin, but somebody has actually been assassinated and they're talking basically about how upset they are that a movie is getting ruined. And then every now and then they'll go, oh, but thoughts and prayers. Yes, of course, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. And thoughts and prayers, I would say, is this beige sort of pluralist Christianity where nobody's really thinking about what has happened. Certainly nobody's praying to a God who could intervene and make it right. It's just become something we say in the, in the right sort of context. Oh, thoughts and prayers are with you. Are, are they? Are they? Probably not. It's a tokenistic response to a culture that promotes tolerance rather than truth and desires broad generalist inclusion rather than complexity on the way to truth. So that's one possibility. But the second possibility is the one that I take because I think it's the way of Christ and that's the possibility of redemption. And that's the possibility that even though, yes, saying grace may in truth be a combination of leftover Catholic guilt and cultural appropriation <laughs> and the sense of family that the producers at Universal want to sell us, uh, it may continue to point to a hunger that is really broadly seen in our world, particularly from those of non-Anglo origins, to explore spirituality and faith in a way that points back to and honours God even as they work out their own mess. And that's one of the things I love about the Fast and the Furious franchise is the person that says grace is the person who eats first. So the person who offers grace is the person who stuffs up the rules. It's, it's inbuilt. And when they say grace, it's never really that good. It's this sort of awkward like, ah. Oh. Um, at the end of the sixth movie, Roman says grace and, it, and it's great. And he just, yeah. he just gets into his like, Father, we thank you. And this, it's this heartfelt, really quite Christian moment in the midst of a very, very secular movie. It's familiar. It's powerful. It's attractive. Wine, bread, conversation around a table. Community that leads to real conversation. Honest truth. God knew what he was doing <laughs> when he created the table of the Lord. I just want to fast forward to the last bit. You can't get through the Fast and the Furious franchise without talking about the death of Paul Walker and the way that life imitates art. 
It brings this unexpected spiritual weight to the Fast and the Furious. Because in the Fast and the Furious franchise, there's no consequences for actions. Um, Head-on collisions are walked away from. Gunfire only hurts the characters we don't care about. And consequences can be bargained away by doing bigger acts of crime and mayhem. But in real life, Paul Walker dies when his speeding Porsche crashes into a pole and catches on fire. What do we do with that? There's, there's huge consequences for Paul Walker and his family. And the Fast and the Furious franchise will, will finish on the scene because there's really no other scene you can finish on except the end of movie number seven. Um, they chose to honour Paul Walker's passing with this beautiful description of him taking another path, yeah. one that leaves behind violence and death and destruction in order to pursue a, a more beautiful pursuit of what family could really look like. And fittingly, perhaps, Walker was an evangelical Christian. He grew up as a Mormon and uh, converted in high school. And to the, to the best of our knowledge, he, he may be the only evangelical Christian on the cast of The Fast and the Furious. Now, I'm not going to pretend that he died for his sacrifice or anything like that. I'm not going to try and draw any Jesus parallels there. But his tragic death reminds us that there are real consequences to sin and rebellion and lawlessness. But the one that we followed not only took a different path, he really did die for it to overcome those consequences. Uh, if Jesus is talked about as being the, the true Adam, you could call him the true Dom in this case. Dom is the Christ figure, but Jesus is the Christ. He's the one who really did leave behind violence and death and destruction, sacrificing himself for his family to provide a way to a better future, both now and forever. And the Fast and the Furious universe asks this question at the end of episode number seven. Will we see each other again? What happens in eternity? There's this, there's this yearning in the midst of it. The fingerprints of God are just everywhere in the Fast and the Furious franchise. So I'll just quickly finish up and then we'll play this clip. Uh, it's, it's in the understanding of fatherhood and family that's presented. It's in Dom Toretto, messianic figure and his disciples. It's in the unity and diversity of Dom's family as a picture of a new restored earth and fulfillment of redemption. Fulfillment of revelation, rather. It's, it's in the forgiveness and the redemption arcs of people being consistently welcomed back into his family. It's in the saying of grace and the gathering around the table together in the midst of our brokenness. And it's in the creation and the imagining of a better future. And this, this next scene taps into, I think, a hunger as well as the best efforts of people who don't know Jesus to offer a picture of what they're yearning for. What time do we finish here, Aaron? Um, any time between now and 20 past. Okay. Cheers. All right. Oh, it's we'll, uh, you know you love them. I'll chip a minute off.
Pretty good. It's pretty good for an action franchise to to find a way to end with that much meaning to to celebrate Paul Walker's life in, in the very best way they knew. And I mean, did you hear the Christian imagery soaked in that? Where is he? His home. It's where he belongs. It's where he's always belonged. And then throughout it, Dom's pointing the most important people in this room. Yeah. Anyway. And then, of course, they emotionally manipulate you at the end of the eighth movie because he calls his son Brian, which is Paul Walker's character's name. Gets me every time. Anyway, so that's, that's the Fast and the Furious. Um, I, I just think the, there are so many shadows of the true gospel in it, more than we imagine. That's it. Hope you enjoyed. <laughs>